he finds what originally fell out of Captain Peacock's coat. And it's a membership to the Blue Cinema Club, which was um, this old adult movie theater in London. It closed in like 1985. Oh, it was a real place. Yeah. Yeah. But I was looking up the address of this place. And as of when I last saw it, it's currently a Poppy's Fish and Chip spot. Um, there's a few mm. locations. So I can't eat there knowing what went on. I would want to eat there even more knowing what went on. Ew. It's not like they have buckets of old cum that they put on your fish. It's that's like, the batter. It's, it's, that's called tartar sauce. <laughs> I'm glad I'm allergic to fish. Welcome back, everyone, to S1E1, the show where each week we pick a different sitcom, watch just the first televised episode forgetting anything we might know about the future run of that show. Rate it and decide if it's a show we want to greenlight or cancel. This week we're talking about Are You Being Served? Are You Being Served went 70 episodes with 10 series on BBC One. Today we're talking about episode one, which was called Are You Being Served? Originally airing September 8th, 1972. So to get things started, I'm Jay Gags. With me as always, all the boys, Gordo, Joe, Nick, and Ferg. What's going on, guys? hey yo, Yo. Oh, Miss Brahms. Pull your skirt down. British this, things. This debuted on my birthday. 1972, the year Gordo was born. Well, no, on the day, on the day yes. that I was born. <laughs> what? How many episodes did this go, Jay? 70 over 10 years. No, what? 69. I read on the wiki. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably because when I checked it, it was either 70 because this is technically episode zero, or they did a like a movie special. So it might be including that. The funny thing about this is that this wasn't this pilot was actually aired during the Olympics when they had to cut away because of some massacre that happened in Germany. How do you not know about the Munich massacre <laughs> in 1972? That's such a because huge... I was born in 1985. Yeah. Do you know what World War Two is? I was a little before this, but yeah, sure. But I'm saying also you know, a like, little bit larger. <laughs> the, the Munich Olympic thing. Also great movie, Munich. Do they count when they were like for this show when they were in? They stopped working at the store at some point and worked at like a hotel or something, don't they? I think that's one of the spinoffs. Okay, or that's Are You Being Served Again? I'm uh, I'm <laughs> focused on episode one, so I don't know. I, I really don't know a lot about the show. Well, no, you're talking about the seasons and stuff. I was just oh, wondering yeah. if that counted. There's also like five Christmas specials, a movie, at least one continuation, and a spinoff. So this show had legs. Yeah, the Brits really ate this shit up, huh? <laughs> well, when we talk about a lot of other shows that are like British television shows, which we've covered a few now, but like the idea of like these shorter series that they do, as opposed to here, I mean, it started to condense down in America a bit, but back in the day, it's like, oh yeah, season one, thirty three episodes, <laughs> like that would take them four years with shows like this. Yeah, they do like little like long breaks in between, which I guess if you're not doing the continuity of one year, right? If you're not like it's the same year. In the place, right? Then you don't have to worry about aging. If in a in a show like this, it kind of works where you're like every day is at work, so that doesn't matter what time of year it is. You're always in the same place. If they age, it's just they're all still. Work. And the fact that most of the cast is older anyway, you get the idea that they've all worked there a long time. Also, I think this takes the distinction of being the first show we've ever done where every single actor, the director, the producers, the writer. Every single person, including the woman who's like the hot young woman, are all fucking dead. To quote a show we've done previously that's also English, they are all dead, Dave. <laughs> They're Captain Peacock, dead. no! Captain Peacock is dead. Captain Peacock's character is a captain because he was in World War II. Like, this is how <laughs> old the show is. It's fucking wild that everybody is dead. And some of them, like... Fairly recently, I'm like reading. It's like, and they passed away in like 2014. You're like, holy shit! He was probably 35 in World War II. <laughs> yeah, but not to be dour. Weird watching a show where literally nobody's left. So nobody's gonna retweet this. <laughs> yeah, probably. Why do, not. why do we even bother? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we really do it for the retweets. I was just trying to double check it. I believe. Um, so, are you being served? Was originally supposed to be episode 36 for us. And to peel it back, so this is, you know, we usually take turns making picks, and it was a Gordo pick. And it was the first time that we vetoed a show entirely. <laughs> and we said, we are not doing that show. And then as time's gone on, it's become a fan pick. Actually, a friend of ours, Emily, shout out. You listen to us every week. Thank you. 
one of the people who's who's requested we do it. So uh, we're revisiting it. No, she's this on is... Team Gordo. No, no. Yeah, Gordo, many Terrible. moons ago, when you when you decided you wanted to do this one, and thirty, and we're talking over a year ago. Was there any mindset at the time? We were we were trying to balance out a lot. Of, well, I was, anyways, um, by trying to get us some um, different shows from different countries. And so, if you guys remember in the beginning, I was always picking like either Faulty Towers or I. Or I picked a uh, like Red Dwarf, or I was picking Danger something. Five. Danger Five. You picked Red Dwarf because this vetoed it. That's, Red Dwarf that actually was, was the yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Replaced it. To be fair, Red Dwarf is one of the best best shows of all time. It is. It's one of our best shows of all time too. Yeah, yeah. actually, go back and watch Red Dwarf, everyone. But yeah, no, it, it's just because I enjoyed watching this as a as a kid. I remember watching this with my family in the kitchen. This and keeping up appearances, which will be coming Same. at some point down the line. And yeah, shout out to our, our Brits homies. I can't find it. But do you remember when PBS, I mean, I used, we used to watch a lot of PBS like yeah, at night. We play all the English shows, how we watched, you know, Red Dwarf and all that. And uh, Red Green, one of the best Canadian shows of all time. But yep. they used to do those telethons where it was like, if you donate to PBS, we're going to send you stuff or whatever. So my parents, I have it, and I couldn't find it. I was looking for it all day. I have a Molly Sugden mug, and it's a black mug with three different um, photos of her, like, overlaid across it. So I don't know if it's packed up still or if it's still at my parents' house. I have to find it, but I'll, uh, I'll post a picture of it. I want to be drinking my English tea out of it today, but I can't find it. I hope you find it and drop it in shatters. I, oh, I wow. knew you would not have a good time with this one. I did not <laughs> think this was going to be an enjoyable watch for a lot of people. I will say this, though, even though I do like this show, this is sort of a hard show to do in our format. And I thought that from the very beginning. I was like, this is going to be a tough one to, like, digest without just reading the script because it's so much. It's so visual. This was very challenging for me to get some notes done. And um, before I go on, actually, I want to just mention S1E1Pod.com. That's where you can find all the links to where to follow us on our show socials. Uh, give that a follow. Watching this, I have no real familiarization with the show, so I'm watching this fresh. You didn't watch this with a grandparent? No, but like my mom, when I was downstairs earlier, I was talking to my mother and I was com- I was complaining about this. I was like, it's taking me fucking forever doing all these notes. And she asked me what show we were covering and I mentioned it. She's like, oh, I used to watch that. But um, this wasn't one that I would sit on the couch with mom and, and watch. I, I, I never, I just remember that my mom liked old British comedies at times when they were on television. This was, I was forced to watch this with my grandmother who always had it on mm. so i always will correlate this with being an old person show oh for sure but now after seeing some of the adult jokes they tell them how uh old people show being gross you know it's funny i always think about they talk about britain in the 70s a lot when you watch like music documentaries or anything right and they're like there was a garbage strike and it was bleak and everybody was on the dole and they paint this picture of like society as a whole was really bad there right like bad unemployment and all this like civil unrest and everything. But then you watch a TV show from that time too. And it's just like boob joke, boob joke, penis joke, penis joke. This guy's gay. This guy's gay. And like, I didn't remember this being so cheeky. I would call the show. Yeah, cheeky. I think exactly. Me neither. Me too. I've noticed whenever they would go there with jokes like that, the audience would erupt. Like that was definitely the humor level of at least the people in that area at that time, because any light joke that was remotely sexual went over very well with the audience. Yeah, and you can tell, I mean, the UK has always been much more liberal to that sort of stuff. I mean, like, they've had nudity on TV forever. There's nudity in the newspapers, right? Like, it's always been just a much more liberal about thinking about that sort of stuff. But this is also around the same time when we would have started to get things like uh, All in the Family and TV shows that would start to push the boundaries of, like, what you can and can't joke about, what you can and can't do on TV in the US as well. One thing I wanted to bring up about this before we even start was how when I when I originally found the episode for us to cover it was like black and white. And I just assumed the pilot was in black and white. And then you read up on it and you go, Oh no, it was originally filmed in color. And then they lost or wiped out the tape. They just couldn't find it. So for years and years after this only existed in black and white. And it wasn't until 2010 that it finally aired in color again for the first time since 1972. Some guy just go, Oh, there it is. (laughs) No, they recolorized it. (laughs) Yeah. Like they found like the original, I think, Film. tape or something that, something they could work off of so i i was reading that they they filmed it in color but they had yeah. to broadcast it in black and white because not ever because in the 70s not every television 
could get color and it was like a weird broadcasting thing. And then that color version got lost. Yeah, they had both versions of it and the colored version got lost. So then the only one they had left was the black and white and then they colorized it. What I thought was funny is that they colorized it so late. Like they colorized it 10 years ago, pretty much when like, do you remember when we were kids, like 1990, 91 or whatever, when Ted Turner started colorizing movies? Yeah, and people were fucking pissed about it. We're like, we're going to go back and colorize all these classic movies or whatever. And so the, the idea that like this didn't happen then, this happened like, I don't know. It was probably a product of when they could find the right strand of whatever. I don't know the process, but it does say, it would say at the end, it said at the end of the recording, like, you know, filmed in BBC color. So it was still a fairly new thing for them, but the Beeb it was intended to be in color. Well, I think that's actually why you guys originally vetoed this on me. Because you found it, too, and you said, oh, my God, this is in black and white. We are not doing this show. I don't recall if we had no. done any black and white yet, because we, we did the we Munsters didn't. and Adam's Family our first year, but I don't remember when it we, That up. was way later, though. It, no, it was the fact that this show was coming at, after something else dry, and we needed something else instead of that. I, I we always did try to teeter. I still do try to teeter in line where we're positioning our shows in such a way that we're we're mindful of what kind of fan bases we have where and where you, you want to try to mix them in a way so that you don't go a long stretch where you're going to lose people. So we, we need to make sure that we're not, you know, catering to just one audience for too long. I love throwing in the classics too, though. Like we did fucking quirky fest last week and now we're doing something that's so, yeah. so wildly different. Did you see on the, I don't know if it's in the copy of every version of it, but in the beginning of the episode, it says comedy playhouse. Did you guys look into what comedy playhouse is? Yeah, so it was like a uh, like an independent like comedy, not sketch, but you know segments. How like how Mama's Family started the way it did before it was its own show. Did you see that they what they did though is they played pilots. They they would basically make a pilot for a show and air it like f- five different pilots, whatever a season. That is like gold for us as a like as our whole thing. We're like I didn't realize that's completely what it was. I would love to, I wish the U.S. did something like that too, or I wish somebody would do that now. Like, I mean, I still stand by, I wish somebody could just have a streaming channel. I know I've stood on this mountain before that just uploaded all of these lost pilots or unaired pilots or canceled pilots. Like all this money went to all these shows with all these famous big people that you'd love to see. You know what I'm curious about with that? I wonder if there's an element of you have to start paying people that didn't have to get paid because it was never bought. You know what I mean? It must be. Like, they own the pilot, it exists, but maybe once it airs somewhere, then you're, like, liable to have to pay everybody. It would be residual-based, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe that's what, once we get famous, that's going to be our uh, our claim to fame, is we find all these unaired pilots and put them on daily motion so that we're not, you know, liable. I like the idea that this started, I thought you were going with how we would make more money, <laughs> and then you're talking about putting it on a legal streaming service. How are we going to get copies of these shows to begin with? Also, if you have a grand illegal plan, you probably shouldn't dispense it over a podcast and let everyone know that that's what we'd be doing. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to I'm going to dress up like something. I'm going to walk into these vaults. Hello, I'm Captain Peacock. I'm here to look at the <laughs> pilots that never aired. <laughs> sure thing, Captain Peacock. <laughs> so I think we should just get into this episode because it is a 28 minute episode. I don't want to uh, I don't want to go too, too long on this one. This is up there for the longest we've talked without starting the episode. <laughs> yeah, and not the episode to do it on, but... All right, so to get into the episode itself, the whole show takes place in a department store, like on one floor of a department store. And we see this kind of camera that's going from the front all the way to the back, which is where the elevator is. And as it's panning across, you hear like a little bit of a jingle while the elevator is being like in use. You can hear the like the sounds of it moving with like almost a cash register noise. And the jingles... um. Ground floor perfumery, stationery and leather goods, wigs and haberdashery, kitchenware and food going up. So I believe that's supposed to be the, the dialogue happening inside of the elevator as they're um, bringing you into this floor. It always makes me think of, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Patton Oswalt special where he talks about the World Trade Center's falling and being like, third floor, menswear, <laughs> whenever I hear this jingle, that's all I think of. That sounds about right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we get to the elevator, and that leads to where the department store is. And when it opens, you see that it wasn't, like, leveled properly. And I, it's they're probably about two feet higher than when the floor level is actually supposed to be when the door is open. So you can see the majority of them. Pardon me, the lift. 
Yeah, because it's, you know, we don't operate elevators the same way anymore. Like the lift operator thing is, you know, no longer something that we've, I've never been on an elevator like that in my life. I don't know if you guys have. But those elevators are like a skill. You have to stop it in certain places and be yeah. good at the job, you know? That was Harriet Winslow's original job. That's true. Perfect strangers? Yep. Gordo, do you say you've been on an elevator like that? Yeah, I mean, I've been on like freight elevators where you can inch it. Like I have one at work. Oh yeah, there's like stuff like that. But those are so easy now because they have like their buttons and it's like there's less skill to it. But No, the freight elevator at my office is actually like it won't stop on the floor like the get the maintenance guy has to do it. It's like a like a airplane throttle basically that you have to like slow it down and like stop it at the right spot. It's definitely from the eighteen hundreds. It's crazy. Nick, you worked with me at the Bank of America building some point back in the day. No. No, I know what you're talking about. I was never there though. Oh, okay. I I was gonna say, like, you go into these big office buildings and they still have somebody operating an elevator. And I don't know if like the elevators are modern or it's just an old throwback or what, but no, it's a th- it, it's a throwback. It's like when they have the attendants in the bathroom. You can wash your own damn hands, but they still have them there. Well, imagine the elevator operator isn't the best job, but it must have its ups and downs. <laughs> ah. Yeah, this is where we first meet Mrs. Slocum and uh, Ms. Brahms. Ms. Brahms mentions that the, you know, the lift operator should have been there with them to help them move. The move is apparently like what is the whole setting for this first episode. And what's happening is in the department store, they're moving women's wear to the same floor where the men's wear is. And they're sharing space. And that's the premise of everything happening. That's everything, yeah. I was I was a little impressed because uh, Mrs. Slocum when she she hops out of the elevator in fucking heels. It's only a couple feet down, but she's yeah, an older right. lady and she she's in heels and like effortlessly jumps down. I was like, oh shit! Yeah, Molly Sugden jumps off like she's doing an acid drop on a skateboard as an old lady in heels, and then Mrs. Brahms, who's a younger woman in her twenties, like gingerly climbs down off of it. She takes like one big step. She has real long legs. Yeah, but Mrs. Slocum, how old would you... She's probably in her 60s? I would say 50s. 50s? Oh. Yeah, 50s, around that. But when they did that whole bit, I would have bet money when they shut the door and it opened again, they were going to be too low the next time. I thought the same thing, yeah. yeah. They, wait, they wait for you to pay that one off. Yeah. <laughs> As they exit, they're wheeling like a rack of women's clothes over to where they need to start setting up, and they bump into Mr. Mash. And he, he's like, oh, blimey, women's drivers. <laughs> Mrs. Slocum tells him, you know, instead of making sarcastic remarks, you know, you can give us a hand. And he just calls her a middle class cow and walks away from her. <laughs> Fucking lost it for a Jew as hell. Yeah. I like immediately put that in the Rolodex of things I'm going to yell like when someone's a shithead to me at the Starbucks or something. I'm like, you fucking middle class cow. So the camera actually, what they do is they use Mr. Mash as a way to have the camera flow. So as he walks away from her, it follows over to where the men's area is. And that's where he has a conversation with Mr. Humphreys. I, I got to say, it's as I was writing the notes and as it happens here, because everyone is addressed by their last names. It's like Mr. or Mrs. It's like, this isn't Reservoir Dogs. This is going to take so long to talk about everybody at all times. This because I don't know anyone's name. Like, first, you should have just wrote the hump. There's so many people that come in. It's hard to not just be like, oh, the blonde foppish guy or... And Captain Peacock is an easy one to remember. Or like, I'll say this now. The only character I could tell you right now is Captain Peacock. The rest are just faces in my head. Same. I remember all their names. No, Mrs. Slocum with the hair. Oh, yeah. I could do that one, too. Yeah, yeah but Gordo, she has normal hair in this episode. She does, but in the later episode, I mean. It changes a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it's usually purple or pink. But it's or... blue in this episode, which is like a, a British. No, color. it's normal colored. Yeah, she had normal hair. No, it was blue. It definitely was not blue. To be fair, to be fair though, her hair, to be fair, her hair may have been actually a crazy color for this first episode, and we don't know because they colorized the black and white version, and we don't really have a definitive way of knowing what her hair color was in this. Possibly. But if they colorized it, it's already been established her thing is colored hair, so wouldn't they have made her hair color? They should have gone like Cesar Romero Joker green if they were doing the colorization and be like, <laughs> fuck it, let's go wild with this one. When Mr. Mash starts talking to Humphreys, he's talking about how she's letting all this women's lib go to her head. And he tells him, well, I hope not. If she burns her bra, we'll have to call the London Fire Brigade. <laughs> there are so many quick, funny lines like this. And I love that Ferg's laughing. Everybody laughed at this, right? Even if you didn't like this yeah. show, you had to laugh at some of these jokes. No, well, here's the thing about that joke. 
what's the joke? She has big tits. I, I think that she, it's supposed to be. I think it's more of a large, oversized underwear joke. It's she's a big woman, and if they, she burned her bra, it would be a big fire. Yeah, but I, I don't know. Her bra is big. Isn't isn't too insulting most of the I don't know. The way I do, like thought about the joke, I was like, I don't quite see the insulting part. Well, maybe you should stop being such a middle class cow, and you'll figure it out. <laughs> Lower middle class cow. Mass goes on talking about how he's not happy about the women's department joining the floor. And the store has been the way it's been since he was a boy. Then he asked Mr. Humphreys what he's planning on doing about it. Like, well, a matter of fact, I was thinking about chaining myself to the lift gates. And he just goes, kinky. What was the other <laughs> show where someone just said kinky? Because I know it's not the first time it happened. Oh, man. And I'm drawing a blank because as it happened, I'm like, I know there was another show where someone just went kinky. Yes. Fuck. It's going to come to me at like three in the morning. I'm going to have to like text all of you. <laughs> was it the nanny? I don't think so. Was it another British show we did? Maybe. Kinky seems to be more of a British term than a US term. I wish I could remember it because it's so like, it was so, it flagged in my head immediately. I'm not going back through our episodes to find out. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe one of our fans can. Yeah, if you want to listen back now, this is what, episode 98. If you want to go through all the other 97 <laughs> episodes, tell us which yeah, one. Check the S1E1 wiki that has all of the reference points. If someone was just transcribing every episode, then we'd be able to just do a, a quick word search. Yeah, Mastin heads back over to the women's area to deliver this display item to them. And it was basically like torso with like light up breasts to display bras. And Mrs. Slocum wants nothing to do with it and asks Ms. Bronze if she could go hide it somewhere. But that's when her boss, Captain Peacock, shows up and informs her that he needs, it needs to be displayed somewhere prominent because like the marketing department, whatever it is, but it's being paid for it. So it has to be seen. I just had a real I'm an idiot moment. I thought the bra lit up and that the bra was like a special light up bra. No, I didn't realize so, that it was the yeah. mannequin that lit up. <laughs> it was the mannequin, yeah. And I was like, that seems like kind of a weird, not so conservative thing to have in this stuffy department store. But I guess no, <laughs> that's not what it was. And I feel like a total moron. Also, do you think Captain Peacock sounds like someone from Danger 5? A hundred percent. Yeah. To me, it sounds like a character from Clue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Damn you and your fast talking. <laughs> is that what it is? He's a, is he supposed to be a captain from the war and this is what he does now? That's how he earned the title? Yeah, his character is supposed to be that he was in the North African conflict in World War II and that's how he got the captain. Okay, I didn't know if there was like a cultural thing that I don't understand where like certain people are called captain for whatever reason outside of military. Yeah. Again, this show is just so old that like, you know, you're coming, you're coming right out of World War II generation. People weren't that, you know, weren't that old yet. Yeah. Well, isn't there a isn't that kind of a British thing too? That like maybe it's not this show, but do, does, isn't there another show where people call like the grandfather major? There's like another sitcom. Maybe it's not British, but like they call like the older generate that generation like by their military rank, and I forget what show it is. The King of the Hill? No, no, no. They don't no because they call him Cotton. They call him Cotton. Yeah, yeah. he's just Cotton. No, there's and it's it's a well known show too. Oh, Major Pain, <laughs> Major Dad. <laughs> That's definitely coming soon, Major Dad. I know you're talking about Gordo. I can think of that, but yeah, that may have just been a thing when when there was such a big war that so many people went to that as a sign of respect, you just referred to people or you know by their rank. Oh no, Gordo, it's a movie. You're thinking of Sergeant Kabuki Man, NYPD, which I just saw yesterday was on Peacock. Turned to Kelsey and said, "Oh my god!" And it's she just Peacock? gave me the look of like, "We're not watching Sergeant Kabuki Man." <laughs> I can't believe that's on Peacock. Maybe you're thinking of analyze this when Billy Crystal meets uh, Lisa Kudrow's dad, and he goes, "Call me Captain." No, no, the name was. Are you major. sure? I know you're a big analyze this fan. I like analyze that better personally. <laughs> That's fucking weird. <laughs> Jelly, get the fuck out of here. We cut back to the elevator, and this is where we meet Mr. Lucas for the first time. And just like the women before him, he's having trouble getting the lift to line up properly, only he's about three feet lower. He has to, like, crawl out of, uh, out of the lift to get out. And as he, as he comes out, he has to pull this female mannequin out with him. I don't know. It's like a ranking system. Mr. Granger's, like, not their boss, per se, right? Is he just a senior employee? Yeah, I think there's just a seniority level here because even the commission and sales and how you go after customers is... Yeah. No, he's the head of department for the men's department. Yeah, I didn't know if, the, if he was technically the boss or not because the way it seemed, it just seemed like he was the senior guy. But there was an air of responsibility that went with it. But in any event, Mr. Granger sees it and he has issue with how little the mannequin has on, especially because the breasts were like fully exposed. So Mr. Lucas resolved that by covering them with his hands. <laughs> 
And when he asks Lucas how long he's been working there, he tells Granger uh, a month. And he says that he's still feeling his way around as he's holding said mannequin breasts. Get it? This whole scene is oddly sexually charged. Kinky. Kinky. What is that from now? Because I know we've discussed it on another show and it's driving me nuts. Yeah, it's, it's really hurting Oh, wait brain. a minute. That was David Brent did it, didn't he? Maybe it wasn't something we covered. Who's David Brent? From um, The Office, UK. Ricky Gervais. Definitely is... not from that because I know what we're talking about and I don't remember him ever saying it. Or he may have said it, but that wouldn't be what went to my head. All right. Well, in any event, we can't dwell on that for the next hour or so. Yeah, we can. Then as uh, Mr. Lucas and Ms. Brom attempt to lift and bring the mannequin to the front display its head got cut in the elevator and it like pulled it off from the body which i just thought the way they did it was really smooth they picked it up and like the timing is real well whoever was like uh, you know doing the elevator yeah i thought this was really good actually they did it in a way that it didn't look too obvious that he had to position the head in it was like pretty pretty seamless rather and you can tell that that elevator is like a not super well put together prop too like where they walk by it the doors are like clearly the plywood moving so the fact there's probably two people like holding the doors closed to make sure the head stuck and like everyone did a great job timing that they bring it all the way to the front and start setting it up once it's completed is when they notice like oh shit the head's gone so he runs back try to get it fixed and when he does so he gets the like the wig off first and he like he puts it on while he's trying to still get the head and suits you yeah <laughs> <laughs> You get the drive-by insult where, he's, where he tells him suits you. He continues on until he finally gets the head loose. Once he does, he brings it over and returns it to the body. But now you can see that the nose is like dented to the side. When Mrs. Slocum notices, he defends it by saying, well, you know, some people have crooked noses. And someday, you know, someone might come in with a crooked nose and look at the dress and say, hey, I'll have that dress. It'll go with my crooked nose. <laughs> There's a sound of a mannequin <laughs> getting his head stuck in an elevator. It's also not terrible logic. It just is for that time, I think. The logic is sound, yeah. Yeah. It is funny, because when we look modern day, 2023 versus 19, they, they, they do similar stuff to that, yeah. Now, it's a thing where they're like, we need mannequins that represent average body types and things like that. But, you know, the logic then was, we need the mannequins to be hot. So you feel like, if I wear this, I will look as hot as this mannequin. Which is a weird thing to think about a blank-faced plastic human you know i don't know it's a weird thing to be like oh it looks hot on the mannequin there was a movie mannequin mannequin two on the move untalkable mannequin two <laughs> <laughs> mrs slocum then tells uh mr lucas that she's gonna have to report this to one of her superiors that pissed me what off. an old hag right <laughs> like right when this happened <laughs> he's just trying to help we've all worked with people like that all right, we all had the same reaction that makes me happy <laughs> yeah because <laughs> yeah. he was just like he's not he, I, there's a lot of like the men versus women kind of thing going on throughout the episode, but he's legitimately just trying to help you. Yeah. You're overtaking his turf. He doesn't need to do anything. He was there first. And now the first thing he does wrong, you're going to throw him under the bus. It was just super shitty. She sticks up for him later, which really confused me. It like, gave me very mixed signals. Yeah. I don't know if she's supposed to like warm up to him or maybe she's just having a bad morning. So she's being kind of shitty to everybody. Is this the will they won't they? No. <laughs> I wish it was. <laughs> he did get a little handsy with her later on. Yeah. Yeah, he does feel up her stockings. It's one of those, it's a tense thing, right? Because none of them want this to happen. So they're probably all a little, like, hesitant to be around the other ones. Next, we see this conversation with Mr. Granger, and he's asking Mr. Humphreys about Mr. Lucas. And it seems to be, like, like concerning to him how much he's been helping the ladies out. And he thinks he should return to his own department. And he asked Mr. Humphreys to find Lucas and tell him, you know, that he wants to have a word with him. And this kind of goes back to what we're just saying. Like, he's like just the only one who's kind of being fair, right? <laughs> because he's just trying to help out. But as it seems, even though Mr. Granger is telling him to like bring Lucas over to me so I can talk to him, he already apparently went over his head. Because the very next scene is Captain Peacock who's having the conversation with Mr. Lucas about this. So it's like, why is he... Why does he need to have a conversation with him if you already went over his head to talk to, to have his boss talk to him anyways? Right. I don't think he went over his head. I think he just, uh, Captain Peacock just happened to walk by and tell him, like, you don't need to help so much. No, it seemed like the way he presented it was like, you know, I've heard you've been helping them a lot lately or whatever. But there was no transition. It went to the next scene thing. So there was no time that he could have told on him. Well, it could have been beforehand. It could have been, you know, this was a thought in his head. He might have said something to Mr. Peacock and then further it up, said it, you know, to Humphreys. Can I just say too, that like 
they're coworkers. Why why aren't you helping each other out? Like, why is that like a thing? Well, they're being territorial because they're losing space now. Yeah, we'll get into it in a second because... And they work on commissions. Yeah, this is commission-based. So they're looking at this as a potential loss of money. So if you take away half of your stock and your inventory that you're able to sell, then that's half of the commissions you can make. If anybody who's worked, you know, any kind of retail, which I know a couple of you have at least, that would be super, you know, annoying, right? Like if half of your floor just became... On a commission-based type of job. Otherwise, you're like, cool, less for me to do. But yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. 100%. <laughs> Any retail that I've done has not been commission-based at all. Yeah. No, and I've worked at five different... I counted this morning. I've worked at five different clothing stores, oddly. Well, they're they're high-end suits, that's why. Yeah, it's like nice slacks and suits and ascots. And there's different and... times, different business models, too. You know, things change over there. And we didn't live through the time, so I, I couldn't even say... Peacock asks him about this whole situation when helping the women. He's like, would you be showing the same enthusiasm if a different department was moving in, like men's shoes? And while this conversation's happening, Lucas has been on his knees trying to clean up the shoes of the mannequin that he scuffed up earlier. And then while talking to Peacock, Peacock tells him to like fix the, the pantyhose on the mannequin. He says he doesn't like when the seams aren't straight. So he turns around to do that. But in that time frame, Mrs. Slocum seemed to have like moved in between him and the mannequin because she was working on it as well. So now he's adjusting her pantyhose. The lucky man right there. <laughs> and then she like kind of like lets out like kind of a light scream. And then he jumps up immediately and apologizes. Luckily, the awkward moments cut off because this is when Mr. Humphreys calls him over to talk to Mr. Granger. That line you said, too, about like, how would you feel if it was men's shoes? I think you'd feel better. If somebody comes in and buys like it's yeah that helps that's like a symbiotic relationship like if you're going in to buy a pair of shoes and you're like you know i bet these would look good with those pants over there or vice versa that makes way more sense to me we should have the women's shoes and women's stuff like in the this department store but i think he's looking at it more as are you only helping them because you're trying to get close with the women sure and he is clearly it's the two young people are you know i think Gordo is on to something with the will they won't they I mean, yeah. Molly Sugden has a few drinks after work. Everyone goes out. <laughs> You're not saying no. Granger is talking to Lucas and he's telling him that it's not that I want you to be unfriendly towards him, but don't be too friendly. And this is what we were saying earlier. He says by them joining the floor, they're losing 30% of the space, which could translate into, you know, 30% less sales and possibly 30% less salesmen. When you look at it, it actually looked like it was kind of a 50 50 split, <laughs> uh, more yeah. than the 30, but. Yeah, I would say it looked like half, but also. Different time, right? Like, look how big that department store is, and it's multi level. Like, it made me kind of like we had that a little still when we were kids. It made me kind of long for going to places to do things, or even think of like a Sears up until the past 15 years, right? It was multiple floors and it was menswear and shoes and all this different stuff, and then tools. Like, it was such a weird everything there, and just that doesn't exist anymore. What about Macy's? That kind of still exists in malls. Yeah, the Macy's in the city is still like that, right? So Yeah. Yeah, that's the only like comparison I can draw. It's not completely gone, but it is dying. It's almost dead. Well, our physical stores are dying. <laughs> Thanks, Amazon. Which is a shame because I like going to do you know, like there's obviously there's a great advantage to ordering things when you need them, but not being able to go do stuff right away is I think a hindrance too. Amazon really tricked us with that two day shipping thing. And then a couple of years later, we're like, fooled you. It'll be here in two weeks. Like, wait a minute. What am I paying for now? <laughs> that advantage is gone. Way gone. But they knocked a bunch of places out of business, too. So they can do it. Like, it's such an evil plan that makes so much sense. It's odd because there's the convenience of online shopping, but you don't get the item instantly. And now because we're knocking off so many big department stores, if you want something instantly and go to a store, you're going to end up paying a premium. So you're either paying for the shipping or you're paying for the premium of getting it immediately. Yeah, but I'd rather pay for the premium of getting it immediately and like being out in the world. Like, I don't know. There's something about like, oh, I have to go pick something up. Or maybe you get something you didn't even know, right? Like that's how stores always survive. Or you get upsold on something because you didn't see it. Like if you go, like I updated my Fitbit last year, right? Because it died. And I went to the Target because I needed a new one. And then I was like, ooh, fancy newer Fitbit and bought one that was like $40 more than my other one, right? Like, cause you're there and you see it and you didn't expect to. And you don't think, I don't think you do that as much with online shopping. You find the exact thing you're looking for. You hit it, order and you go. See, I, I think it's the opposite of that where sometimes, so you were in a store, you were looking to buy something and you ended up spending more. I think with online, it ends up being, 
I'm bored. I want to look for, you know, I, I wasn't anticipating buying anything and now I just bought three things online. You know what I mean? Or the big online thing too is like, hey, you're $5 away from free shipping and then you spend $25 to get the free shipping and it's more than it would have cost to just get the shipping. <laughs> yeah. The story of my my life, my wife will be like, you know, we have we should buy X, Y, and Z. And then she's like, but we're so close to the free shipping. Like, what can we get for, you know, seven fifty more and then it becomes a whole other thing i do that on the disney app all the time you get 75 dollars to get free shipping and i will have spent 40 and i will buy something to make it 70 just to get free shipping i'll spend a lot more money the shipping that would have been seven dollars right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah one thing that i don't like about doing online shopping too is just the idea of some items i need to see yep and like you know clothes items you know it's nice to be able to put things on for see how they fit. And then like just random items sometimes like not knowing exactly how it looks in your hands. Like if it was like, I don't know, like a backpack, like I want to see like all the compartments and how they fit. And it's just weird when you're just trusting like online pictures or shoes. Cause every pair fits different. And sometimes you want like the expert too. like, I know you don't always get it. If you go to a home Depot, sometimes you go to those places and the person doesn't know shit. Like if I worked at a home Depot, I'd be like, uh, it's an L pipe. I don't know. <laughs> but like, you know, if you, Sometimes, like, I had to go get something at a skateboard store. I didn't know what size trucks I needed for this specific size board. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, let me pull out the, like, giant guide to this, and I'll find the exact right size. And, hey, look, we have them here. And, like, that was, like, a nice moment to be like, oh, the expert guy knows how to figure this out. I would have just bought two of them and had to return the one that was wrong. You know what I mean? And now our lives are just sending things to and from Amazon. (laughs) They send it to us, then we send it back, and then wait for the right one to come in. Uh, But to get back into this, again, this tension, right? about the we're going to lose 30% and everything. It's still not, it's not the fault of the women either because they didn't want to move there either. So, and they're going to lose probably 30% too, right? Or maybe more, but you don't know how big their department was upstairs. Yeah. That's the thing. They lose 30% floor space. They don't have to give up inventory. They are not making the most of that space. There's a lot of space. There's a lot of dead space in there. Yeah, yeah. there is. Add a couple more racks or another podium. They're fine. I think back to stores like Pac Sun when we were kids in the mall and like they started utilizing so much space that you didn't even want to be in there anymore though because like there was like there was hardly move like room to move from rack to rack so it's like now i just feel like i'm in a congested closet and i don't want to be in here one of the smartest things is like stores like that or like spencer's or whatever or like even like a hot topic or something where they'd be like we're gonna display all the shirts flat against the wall up high and then have everything folded so that not everything is side out because you save so much walking yeah that is a store a space saver for sure Granger walks off and Mr. Lucas asks Mr. Humphreys about that prospect of 30% less sales. And Humphreys tells him like, you can't have 30% less of nothing. And Lucas is like, well, it's the senior base system that we have, which Joe, you mentioned earlier. And he doesn't even have an opportunity to make sales unless everybody else is busy. I mean, Joe, you work in sales. Do you guys have a system or like, how do you guys go about doing things like that? Yeah, there's a system. So leads are usually generated usually in like a round robin style so everybody gets and like that can be great you can get something amazing but you can also get a total garbage one and that was your at bat so one of the biggest things in sales i think in this would be true for them too is referrals right because somebody comes in and says hey i wanted to do this they come to you directly hey i know x person is using this thing and i want to use it too uh let's talk right and that's a huge part of your business if you can build up those relationships where you get referrals uh, that's that's definitely the best way to do it. And I imagine it's like this too, right? Like if you go to a store like this all the time and you like Mr. Humphreys, you're just going to go to him directly. You're like, no, I, I work with him. He's my guy. I think that's part of the like personality or being like personable in general, I guess, if you're like a salesperson on a floor, like you got to make people feel like you're their buddy and they want to come back to you. Yeah. If you're Mr. Lucas, like, what are you supposed to do? Like you have to, like there's three of you there and the store is not very busy. So unless the store is being mobbed. When do you have an opportunity to sell anybody anything? I will say, though, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't say if this is a weekend or a weekday. I'm assuming a weekday. Monday. It's a Monday because that's when um, the guy comes in. Young Mr. Young Mr. Ernst or whatever his name is. Right. So Mr. Young Mr. Ernst from Hey Dude. Uh, but like also, you know, I don't know how many people are shopping for suits on a Monday at 9 a.m. either. Right. So you're kind of at a tough position to be the opening shift. Peacock heads over. Right before the store is about to open. And he's like looking at Mr. Lucas and correcting him on his appearance, right? First, he tells him he has to straighten his tie out. Then it's the amount of pens that are in his, the pocket of his jacket. 
And then he tells him that he should have like a like the certain ballpoint. He wants him to get a pop pen. And there's a point where Mr. Humphreys like repeats ball points and everyone laughs. And I was like, I don't I didn't catch the joke. I didn't either, yeah. I think it's supposed to just be like a other gay thing where he's making ball. I mean, because there's the when you do the what do you call that thing there? Well, that happens like in a second, yeah. When in he's a second um, too, like that becomes weirdly sexual too that I did not expect. Right. So now he's showing him how to fold like his pocket square. I don't know if, if it was called anything differently, but it's a pocket square. So the captain shows him by demonstrating on himself first. And when that happens, when he pulls it out of his jacket, something flies out. And Lucas attempts to pick it up, but Mr. Uh, captain Peacock stops him and tells him, you know, hey, pay attention. So when he first pulls the cloth up and like grabs at it uh, before like the final fold, I, it's weird to describe for those of you, you know, without a visual, but the crowd loses it when he pulls up the cloth. And I didn't know if it was like a phallic thing. Like, I think it was a phallic yeah, thing. It looks like yeah. a big dick. That's definitely what it was. Yeah. Cause then there's also the laugh when his, when he does it and it droops over, they right. get the like, there was such a laugh and I'm like, is everyone that perverted? <laughs> like <laughs> you love dick humor. What do you mean? Exactly. I do. And my brain's not even going there. Cause I'm just watching him fold a pocket square. I do not get the, him holding it phallically. And because you had Mr. Humphrey in the back kind of eyeing it. I thought it was more, I don't know. Well, when Mr. Lucas pulls his out later, it was, I thought the joke was just how shitty it was. Just a lot of penis play. Oh, it was, his was a limp dick and his was a stiff dick. It makes sense. I just, I didn't, I guess my brain, which is a terrible, dangerous place, didn't even go there at first. So I was surprised. (laughs) A terrible, dangerous place. That's why last week I told all women to stay away from you. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, women Jay's most attracted to, please stay away at all costs. Keep a safe distance. Yeah, so next, Lucas tries to emulate the same thing what he just saw, but his pocket square is beat to shit. (laughs) This is a hole right in the middle. This is a hole right in the middle, so yeah. Oh, I thought it was... Pen oh, that ink. was the ink from the pan. The no, there pen. was a hole. That wasn't a hole. It, no, I thought it was a hole, too. There's a hole, for sure. No, it's because the pens are in his pocket. That's why there was the whole pot. Uh, he told him to get a pot pen. No, that's why he said, grab the center, or and then he sees the hole, and he goes, or as close to the center as you could get. No, it was a big blue ink mark from where his pen was. I th- I'm going hole on this one. It definitely wasn't a hole. My hole... <laughs> Currently, yeah, currently Team Hole is winning three to two, though. We, we, we'll have to refer back at some point. Maybe we'll put it as a clip on, uh, on our Instagram. S21. Yeah, no, point. it's, 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 uh, I'm with you, Ferg. Ink. Hole Inky all the way. Hope you feel good, Ferg. Your only ally, uh, ally on this is Gordo. I am happy about that. All right. That's my buddy over there. Yeah. <laughs> when he walks off, Peacock leaves, and Lucas says something like, What a bloody palaver. Yeah, I didn't get this either. I looked it up and, it did say that the definition of the word, like palaver, I believe the word was. It said it was um, unnecessarily elaborate or complex procedure. So I guess that makes that works, sense. Yeah. Very British. Very British, yeah. I didn't know if that was like a popular term at that time or in that area, but the word did work. I mean, English words and colloquialisms are just so much better sounding than ours, or even weird things. Like in a minute, he mentions like a Mac, which is a raincoat, and you're like, that's just like the term for it, and you're like, that's just simple and sounds classier than saying a raincoat. You know what I mean? Well, because they, it's their language. We have the same language, different we dialect. We do, but we have our own dialect of that language. Yeah, we're like, fucking, we speak the same fucking language as you. I just thought it was strange they call flashlights torches. Ooh, I do like that. It's like they call toilets the loo. Elevator the lift. And give them the nut. What? <laughs> give them the nut. <laughs> Is uh, being fired? I don't want you uh, agreeing with me anymore. (laughs) (laughs) You've lost your one ally, Gordo. And what was our other one? The clung? The clung? Remember? Yeah, I remember us talking about, but now I don't remember if it was something okay to say or not. (laughs) I think it was okay. I don't remember all the conversation, though. Well, next week, if Gordo's canceled or not, we'll know. Yeah, we'll know. (laughs) Humphreys then shows Lucas how he just wears like a fake one that's on, like on a card. I love this for his character, too, because... He's like, you can't kind of get a full read on him. You're like, is he smarmy? Is he super fancy? And then you're like, oh, he knows all the ways to cut the corners. He comes here. off like a little brown nosery, but I will say that he comes off kind of a brown noser, but he doesn't like cut anyone out from under them. Like he had opportunities to like undermine Lucas and he doesn't. So like 
you respect that about him. He's not like a snake. I will say too, it looked very good. Like that's like if you see a clip on tie, almost immediately you can spot it. You're like, okay, that's a clip on tie. That's not a real knot. I can tell it's sort of pasted together. But I couldn't tell that his I mean, we're also looking at a colorized sixty year old. And you're not even thinking that it's a thing. So you're not looking for it. True. But um Lucas asks him, you know, how he puts up with all this, you know, and he tells him you just have to smile and grit your teeth. This is the second set I've had this year, which I found to be kind of a weird joke because his teeth are terrible. <laughs> has a, he has bad teeth. <laughs> and so I thought it was weird to call attention to your teeth on a joke like that because his teeth are pretty jacked up. I just kept thinking of on the Simpsons when they show Lisa, the big book of British smiles. Like <laughs> yeah. I was like, this episode is just the big book of British smiles. And what's that? What does anyone know the true history of that? Because we do have a lot of listeners from over there. And I, I think that was just something that was once true, right? That's not like it's a not anymore. Now. Yeah. It's not for sure anymore. I think it was just at a time there was not the best dentistry and dental hygiene type of stuff. And then also, too, you're talking about going through World War One, World War Two, like this generation of people were through all these wars. And there just was like a lot of, you know, a lot less time. You don't care about your teeth if you're in blitzed. You know what I mean? Yeah, I just don't think they put much emphasis on like dental care. So that's exactly it. My my wife, who's European, the one way you can tell an American is straight teeth. Because we have like a weird obsession with like straight white teeth, whereas in other parts of the world, it's not that big of a deal. Like it's like almost like supermodel, like superficial in America. It's just like an American thing. But that's what was told to me. Big cars, cheeseburgers and teeth. USA. (laughs) I'm okay with that. Give me my straight teeth. Now we see our first customer enter the store and Mr. Lucas is like begging Mr. Humphreys to be able to serve him. But since they go by seniority, the customer, by all accounts, is supposed to go to Mr. Granger. Lucas decides that since he's not there to see him, that he can just jump right in anyways. So Mr. Lucas approaches a guy, and he's showing this guy, like, an overcoat that's on a mannequin. He's giving him, like, the, all the details about it. And when he finally finishes with his, like, sales pitch, he asks the man what size he is, only to find out that the guy just came in to use the bathroom. Or as he called it, the gents, which sounds way cooler. That's one I've never heard. Yeah, that confused me. I, I didn't know what that meant either but it does make sense i think i figured it out but i never heard that term for it before like we were talking about all the their other terms that's one that i've never heard i like this reply was well in that case size doesn't really come into it does it <laughs> another pp joke guys a lot of pp jokes here that makes that joke actually funny because i didn't <laughs> get it at the time yeah there you go like the joke count on this no matter what everybody says at the end of this when we come down to our votes you have to put the jokes that work Versus jokes that don't call him, I think is pretty high. So Mr. Granger walks over and insists to Lucas, you know, had he allowed him to speak with the customer, they could have made some sort of a sale. And then he asked him what he wanted. And when he found out that he was only there for the bathroom, he said, oh, it must be raining. They always come in when it's raining. I was like, what do they do when it's not raining? Like piss outside? (laughs) Yeah, it's an odd thing. I mean, I think that's a huge problem. I don't know if it is so much in the UK, but here it's just like there is not enough outdoor public bathrooms there really isn't like if you really have to piss and like you go to a starbucks or something and you like get a coffee and they're like oh the bathroom's out of order you're like i'm literally drinking a thing that is gonna make me have to pee in like two minutes if only there was a book that told you where all the bathrooms were and how good <laughs> yeah i know they were. right like gordon maybe it's time for an updated abridged version remember we're right near faneuil hall they built that like bathroom of the future the self-cleaning one that you had to pay like a yep. dollar to use or whatever yep and we were like i don't we were, I, were we even maybe freshmen at that time, we were pretty young. And it was like mind blowing to see something like that. And we were just always trying to shove each other in it and lock them in. So it would, it would clean like with the person in it. Likely just murder a person with boiling water. Yeah. In our heads, it was funny. Yeah. I remember like killed someone in like San Francisco when they tried it. Meanwhile, we're all going <laughs> and trying to shove them in the bathroom. Right. To be fair though, if, if there were nice clean bathrooms, you could use all over cities and they were a dollar to use. You got you to pee, you'll pay a dollar. So in when we were in Vienna, that is how all of the bathrooms are in Vienna. You pay like a quarter or whatever the euro equivalent of a quarter is, and they're all cleaned. And you go in, you do your pee-pee, you do your poo-poo, and then somebody comes in and they clean up after you. Perfect spot to whip out your little Vienna sausage. I was waiting to see who was going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> it was right there. It, Vienna sausages are actually not little sausages in Vienna. 
They're actually big, girthy sausage. But only when you're in Vienna. When you're outside of Vienna, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, it must be the air. Just retracts it. That sausage was swimming. <laughs> yeah, the rest of the world, you were always in a pool. But when you're in Vienna, you're bone dry. <laughs> so when Mr. Lucas goes to um, pick up what he thinks is litter, he finds what originally fell out of Captain Peacock's coat. And it's a membership to the Blue Cinema Club, which was um, this old adult movie theater in London. It closed in like 1985. But just like, you know, just they existed here. They don't exist. I don't think they exist anywhere anymore. But just. Oh, it was a real place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the abundancy of especially pre. I mean, there was a lot more Internet, obviously killed it. Oh, video killed it a lot. Right. Like once you can get pornography on video and the proliferation of VCRs that killed off most of them that didn't have live performers in them but it killed all the thrill of jerking off in front of a bunch of other people all right louie chill out <laughs> chill out there uh peewee herman right I, I was just about to bring that up that ended peewee's career peewee who is rich and could have bought i mean fred willard got caught at one like a few years ago before he died so like it's a weird thing that they still do exist but it depends on your fan base right because with paul rubens like his career was triggered towards children so people took it different but I was looking up the address of this place because it closed in 1985. And as of when I last saw it, it's currently a Poppy's Fish and Chips spot. Um, there's a few locations, so. I can't eat there knowing what went on. I would want to eat there even more knowing what went on. Ew. It's not like they have buckets of Ew. old cum that they put on your fish. It's that's like, the batter. It's, that's called tartar sauce. <laughs> I'm glad I'm allergic to fish. Made famous by Tartar Binks. <laughs> Yeah, the I also like that um he signed his membership thing as Captain John Smith. Like he still he wanted to be anonymous, but the captain part was still important to him, so he had to leave that in. Yeah. Still wants the respect though. So now Lucas wants to give it back, but Humphrey says, Well, you know, if he knows that you know that he goes, you know, sitting in that cinema where there's no room for your legs and the, you always have Max over their knees, basically giving away that he's been there himself. And then when he gets called on, he says, well, you know, the doctor told me to go there for therapy. Um, what, what could have broke that he had to go there for like a physical therapy? His dick. Yeah. I think it was a, another gay joke. Yeah. Oh. I, I, thought, I thought it was gay conversion. Yeah. Conversion. Oh, you know, I didn't, I was thinking like physical therapy, physical therapy. You need to go to, you need to work this thing out and you need to go in public. Oh, to do maybe, it. maybe he pulled the Drew Carey and tripped over his yeah. dog right before <laughs> having sex that. with Kate. We got to do Drew Carey soon. I love that show. I my heart breaks every time I think of Drew Carey and we can't watch it. It's such a fucking loss that we can't just watch the whole series. I'll say this. Me and Frog are going to LA in a little over a month, and I tried seeing if they were doing prices right recordings, but they're not while we're there. Did you know they do prices right at night? It's really? Weird. Yeah. I watched it last night. It just came on because we threw on like the the live Paramount channel or whatever, and it's the prices right at night. And last night's was like a family version. I don't know if it's always a family version. But it's a much easier version of the show. Like, literally everybody won. It was crazy. Is it still Drew Carey? Yeah, it's still Drew Carey. So they got that guy working double duty, huh? Because I know you film, like, multiple episodes a day when you film yeah. a talk show like that or a game show. I love his comedy. He's not a good game show host. I didn't mind. I mean, I don't watch it religiously. To go back a little bit with Humphreys and everything you guys have been saying, I got to say, watching the episode, I didn't really pick up on him being a gay character or there being a lot of like subtle gay jokes. I didn't really notice that when I watched it. I think they were just kind of that subtle though. No, he was wicked flamboyant. Yeah. I mean, I think it was pretty obvious, but I mean, the subtlety of it, I think is more of the time, but I think that the jokes and everything were pretty pointed to be saying that. I mean, there's a story about one of the heads of the BBC. I think the exact quote was to use another English term that is not a good term. The guy screamed him to get that quote unquote poof off the show because the BBC guy was so offended about there being a gay character and the creator took a stand and was like, if he goes, I go, which is huge. That's an amazing thing, right? That he was yeah. like, no, fuck that. Especially back then. Yeah. So I think we're maybe, we're maybe even seeing it just a little differently from 60 year on eyes. That's true. Maybe way more obvious to people then, you know, in any event, he continues to tell him, you know, just leave it out and tells him that captain Peacock has eyes like a Scandinavian mountain hawk. And we'll find it on his own if they can just, like, you know, pretend they never saw it. And then, like clockwork, he shows up. And that's, you know, exactly what they do. And he immediately, like, notes it during the conversation. And as a means to retrieve it, asks Mr. Lucas if he remembers how to 
It's flute the pocket square, by the way. Yeah, fluting. That's it. Is it called that because it becomes the shape of a flute? I don't know. And probably not, to be honest. It's probably just something completely. Just... No, that's like a um, like a champagne glass, like a champagne flute. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah, that it does look sense. like that, too. He goes to show him again. This way he can kind of grab his pocket square, drape it over the counter again. Only this time when he goes to flute it and pick it up, he can grab it and grab his little membership card l- along the way. And when he finishes, Humphreys uh, compares it to a conjuring trick, which you see uh, Peacock's eyes kind of like light up right away because he knows that something suspected of him and he kind of walks off immediately. I'll say this. I, I know he was caught, but if he wasn't, that was pretty smooth. <laughs> to pick it up yeah he did a good job yeah i mean i think that's more about saving face right he was able to do it everybody knew that he was doing but he didn't make it obvious he did a good job it's we're not going to talk about it that's how it you know what i mean even if they both know we're just not going to talk about it he also had very good face acting in this scene too because like afterwards like just the mannerisms of his face like you can tell it's not said out loud. This is all done through body language and like facial expressions. Yeah, true. I think we're forgetting that point with the viewers that a lot of this is not, it's like physical comedy, like physical slapstick. Yeah, it's definitely watching this, like I said, doing notes and figuring out how to discuss this episode was challenging because it's just not the conventional way we see television the way it's performed. To go back to just the term conjuring trick, I've never heard that before. And I don't know if that was of the area or just what, but uh, I, I liked it. Uh, I mean, conjuring, I mean, unless you play like RPGs, like you rarely hear like conjuring. Oh, it's the, the movies, the conjuring. Yeah, so you hear it in like an occult term. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's how it's used in like an RPG too. It's usually like a necromancer. Or... It just found, it sounds more like a dark magic when you say it that way. Yes. Next, we finally meet young Mr. Grace who shows up and... He appears to be 120 years old. He was born in 1899. <laughs> if, if anyone at home w- wants to watch this show, just watch this part, because this, the way this guy moved, I laughed the entire time, and I felt like such an idiot. <laughs> but like, I couldn't stop laughing at him walking. Now, they said he was the chairman. Is that of this department store, or is there some other like title that goes a- along with that? Like, Does that mean something different? I think it's of the whole company. Yeah. Grace yeah. Brothers. That's what I was thinking. But just think when this guy was, think of when we were 13, right? So when we were 13. It would have been like, what, 1998, 1999, right? When this dude was 13, he was like cognizant and then like the Titanic sunk. <laughs> like, how fucking wild <laughs> is that? Well, I mean, he went through World War One. He was like 14, 15, World War II, the Great Depression. When World War II broke out, he was. In his 50s. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. It was fucking crazy. Or, or the 40s. So yeah, he was, even for 1971, he was very old when he shows up. And he's just kind of like walking through the place saying good morning to everybody. Like maybe says about 50 times and then he walks off. He's got a great old man shuffle, like Ferg said. And uh, we find out that he's worth $2 million, which I did a little math. In British pounds, because we're assuming that he meant in pounds anyways. Today, that would be 21,683,285 pounds, Damn. which converted to U.S. dollars, $25,995,006. So nearly 26 million U.S. dollars uh, in, if we were to go by inflation. That's not that impressive for a millionaire. In today's terms. Yeah, when we're breaching more billionaires than ever lately, like $26 million, like for somebody who owns a de- like that kind of corporation it's not but yeah i mean it's all adjusted it's not a corporation i get the impression that this is not a corporation this is not a chain this is like a one and done center of london old world like the drew carey show yeah but it's weird because like then why do they have so many layers to their corporate structure you know what i mean if, they, if it's just a one and done store because it's the british way it's the British way. Like you have to, you have to have that organization, an organization like that, that makes so much money. You have to have that kind of checks and balance system. Yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, obviously $26 million is a lot of money, but in modern day, when we find out that there's shortstops that make that to play baseball for one year, that's, you know, it changes the perspective. A Having bit. 26 million isn't enough money that if that store has hardships, he could have, he could have to go bankrupt. You never know, though, because, I mean, having money is very different on, like, what is liquid, what is assets, right? Yeah, that's true. As he walks off, 
you hear uh, Humphreys and Lucas talking, and it's like, oh, well, he can't take it with him. The way he's walking, it looks like it's he's trying to carry it on his back because he was, again, pretty old. <laughs> He's just swinging the cane while he's walking. <laughs> he makes it through to like 1981 and he's on the show until he dies. So he's on the show as his character for like another uh, nine years. Jeez. Well, bless him. R.I.P. We cut back to Mrs. Slocum, who's walking Miss Brahms uh, to the center display that's currently all men's items. And she asked Brahms to ask Mr. Humphreys if he can clear it off so she can display her strapless bras. And it's funny because like even in that moment, you think, why would she think that was going to fly? Like, okay, just call Mr. Humphreys over and tell him to knock off their whole main display so I can put stuff here. Like, that obviously was not going to go. You give them an inch, they take a mile, man. A little selfish, too. Like, you should have just, she should have gone and been like, hey, can we work on a system where we can share space? Don't be demanding about it. I think it's a very, clearly a very prominent display that features, like, up, an upscale suit that they're using. Like, they're actually using it. And they're already worried that they're losing 30, could, you know, could be losing 30% of their sales. Now, granted, the same could be said for the women, not knowing the situation that they were coming from in whatever floor they were in before, but they're not going to just give off their main display now where they're already thinking they're going to be losing money in this whole situation. I would still want to light up broad display in my section because it's a, an eye catcher. You know, if you have them on top of your stuff, people are going to look at it, whether they're buying bras or not. It's something that lights up in the middle of a very kind of drab store. I feel like it's not bad for anybody. Well, I'll say that was not the intention at this point. Oh, that's true. She's wanted to put standard bras up there. You're right. So when she does go and asks Mr. Humphreys, he just kind of passes it along to Mr. Granger anyways. So she thanks him and walks off and immediately he tells Lucas she wants to remove my shirt and put a bra there instead. <laughs> and he goes, just you or for all of us? <laughs> I laughed here. It was one of those jokes that I didn't catch until I read the transcript because it was just so quick that I didn't catch what was said. Well, it builds to from here. Well, the idea is you're supposed to get the visual that she's asking him to remove his actual shirt off and put a bra on his body. Yes. Right. But but the joke also builds, like Gorda says, and keeps going from here. And then it goes, and my slacks. Yeah, exactly. And then it's, it goes to the, the trousers and so forth and so on. So when we cut to Granger helping a customer and he's sending him off with a jacket that didn't quite seem to fit. And like a large, like it's weird. Like he's being sent off with, it was like wrapped in like butcher paper. <laughs> like, like, I don't know. I, I can't imagine like you buying something and being sent off that way. But I think you're supposed to get the idea that he's not a very good tailor because he says that the sleeves are long, but they'll get shorter with wear, but well, yeah. that's not how clothes yeah. wear out. Like things get looser as they get worn in. Right. They weren't just a little too long. They were like past this like middle of his hand. Yeah, and this is why you're at the store. Yeah, you're you're at like a high end store trying to get fit for you know a suit that's not cheap. And you were also to assume that like he worked on this. Right, he's the tailor. He went and hemmed it. So like yeah, I think you usually get that he's just not good at his job or doesn't give a shit. He doesn't. Yeah, he's just trying to sell him off and move him along. He's already got the money. Doesn't give a toss. And next, Miss Brahms walks up to him and he asks her if she's being served. And I, I can understand him not knowing her that well because they haven't worked together for a long time with them just moving in. But she's kind of like in uniform. So I didn't know how he didn't recognize her for that reason. No, I think he did that on purpose. I didn't, put, I didn't pick up on it that way, but I don't know. I got that it was more of a tribalism thing where like he doesn't even know she works there because these people just care about their tiny corner of the world, right? Like it's like war. You're fighting for your little inch of soil. He doesn't give a shit about anybody else who works there who's not part of his immediate. Because there's got to be shoe salesmen and, you know, other people that maybe not everybody interacts with during the day, you know. And then she asks him about taking the shirts down from the center display to put the bras over there. He's like, take the shirts down from the center display. And the way he says it, he's an older man. He comes off as a cross between Emperor Palpatine and Grandpa Munster. I couldn't figure out which one I thought he was more <laughs> like. That's an eclectic <laughs> amalgamation. I don't know who the Emperor guy is. Uh, I've never seen Star, Star Wars? Wars, which you hate. He went over this last week. He hates Star Wars. He's the Emperor, the one who struck back. <laughs> no, the Empire strikes back, yeah. not the Emperor. That's true. No, that's the new groove. Emperor's new groove. <laughs> Hercules, more like Huncules. So Ms. Brown says, Mrs. Slocum didn't like to take down your trousers without asking you first. Again, it's like all these, even the lightest sexual jokes, just the crowd's loving it uh, every single time. Yeah. The crowd sounds like an Arsenio Hall crowd or something when they make these jokes. It's fucking wild. And he tells her if she has any requests of this nature, you, she needs to address him directly. 
So she tells Mrs. Slocum that she has to head over, and as she does so, you get this kind of quick cut over to Mr. Lucas, who's commentating as if it's a boxing match. It goes, round two, Mrs. Slocum comes over uh, to the corner with her two flat feet, and the two start debating back and forth about the display area, and Granger makes it known that he has no intentions of letting her use it. And again, why would he? So she tells him that, well, I'm going to be forced to go over your head. So now she finds Captain Peacock, which, I don't know, every time I say it, it just sounds so foolish. I know, it's so, why did they, did they intend Peacock to be funny? It worked. I think so, because it is. Probably. (laughs) And honestly, all of us remember this character because he has a weird name. I couldn't tell you the other people's names. We've been talking about it for an hour. I didn't look it up, though, but I wonder if it is a fairly common surname. Captain or Peacock? (laughs) Captain. I can't imagine Peacock is a common surname. You know what I don't understand is that display isn't something like you'd be able to really display bras on anyway. She'd be better off putting them all over the mannequins and putting them in that area than anything. If you had like a mannequin up top and then you just kind of place them around the thing because it's like a circular base, I I guess you could. Who decide? Why did she just decide that this was going to be a thing? It's just a territorial thing, I think. It's just one of these ideas that, like, they're moving in and they're trying to get as much space as they can because they're both fighting for room and sales. That's a pissing contest. I will say, I looked up the surname Peacock, and there are tons of famous people with it. A lot of baseball players, a lot of musicians, but it's an English surname. Brian Danielson first went to WWE. He um, pitched the name Buddy Peacock. That was one of the names he was thinking he would be in his WWE run. That is a terrible name. That I'm glad that didn't happen. That's almost as bad as Scotty Goldman. There was another one who was like <laughs> Lord Bonier or something. He wanted his last name to be Boner. <laughs> he thought it was funny. I'm surprised Vince didn't go with that. That seems like a very Vince thing to do. Ah, oh, you mean like a cock? Ha! A boner. I love it, pal. Good shit. In any event, when she tells Peacock about what happened, she said, you know, I, ta- I try to talk to Mr. Granger and accommodate on the center stand. And he basically told me to get stuffed. And she's like, well, not like in so many words, he said that. He didn't say that directly. And she told him that when I moved down to this floor, I was told I was going to be given a proper amount of display space. To try to get Mr. Peacock to, or Captain Peacock to agree, she started to get a little flirty with him, you know, and says, oh, call me Betty. And, you know, really like giving him flirty eyes. But when he isn't too quick to override the situation, she snaps right out of it to the point where she's kind of being the authority to him and very demanding and angry pretty much demands that he goes and speaks to Mr. Granger now. I do like the idea, though, of trying to flirt with somebody in a situation. And again, God love you, Molly sucked in. But like, you know what I mean? Like being a flirty person where like it would never work. You know what I mean? I do love that as a move because I just find that to be comedy all the time. So when um Mr. Peacock, I keep calling him Mr. Peacock. When Captain Peacock. Show him some goddamn Granger, He did not fight in World War II for you to call him Mr. Peacock. Peacock. <laughs> so uh, when Captain Peacock heads over. The conversation's like a little awkward and slow at first because they were like beating around the bush. But eventually he tells Mr. Granger, hey, can I have a word with you privately? And when they do, Granger asks Humphreys, hey, can you take over for me for a minute? And then Mr. Lucas asks Humphreys, do you want me to take over for you while you're taking over for him? And he's like, no, go over there and listen to what they're saying. So they get to talking about how slow come is and how they both spoke with her so far. And they both agree that she's difficult woman. They also say that most women are difficult. <laughs> and Granger tells Peacock that, you know, we've known each other for many years. You know, I'll do anything to smooth things over, aside from giving her that display. And as soon as he says that, you see Mr. Lucas hear it and then run over to Ms. Bronze and just go, you're not getting it. <laughs> and <laughs> Unless he's just being a shit disturber for no reason. Right. And then she runs over and tells Mrs. Slocum, who gets on the phone and asks for Mr. Rumbled. This is what I'm saying. There's a lot of steps to this department. There are a lot of people in the hierarchy. I will say, too, again. There's so many characters to keep a hold of, and now it's like, we just introduced another one. Oh, and guess what? He also has a secretary, so here's another character. We were like, geez, this is too many people. And she tells um, Mrs. Slocum at first, oh, I'm afraid he's still sitting with Mr. Grace at the moment, Um, but it turns out he's leaving. By the way, that receptionist, it's her voice that sings the jingle at the beginning of the song. Oh, neat. Interesting. She's the one who sings when the Twin Towers fall. What? What? Anyways. (laughs) So now... Mr. Grace is leaving, and again, we see the, you know, the Crypt Keeper walking by the whole department store. <laughs> he reminds me of the old man from the fucking uh, Six Flags commercials. 
he is a little Six Flags man yeah. You know? But he's he's an interesting old man. And again, he's just saying good morning to everybody as he's walking out. As he walks by, you're like, oh, I wonder where he's going. I'd like to say it's a toss up between the bank and the Undertaker. <laughs> I am American badass. Undertaker just drives out. <laughs> Gets on the back of the motorcycle. <laughs> he drives the old man away. <laughs> when this poor guy gets to the top of the stairway, by the way, he, he goes to look and greet him, and he's like, you've all done very well. <laughs> then he goes and he falls. And like the, <laughs> yeah. His like, handler yeah. has to like catch him. So fun story. Um, when, when I was, before I was in the command center, I was still an officer. Uh, we used to have Mayor Menino a lot at the BCEC. He used to have two guards, and one of them's job was to catch him if he falls over, because he fell over so often. So we were riding, taking him up on the elevator, and he went over into this dude, and they hit the side of the elevator so hard, I thought it was going to stop. Imagine that as a job description. Like, I'm the fall guy. (laughs) (laughs) Literally, yeah. After he leaves, Mrs. Slocum finally gets on the phone with Mr. Rumble, and as a result, she gets a meeting with all of them together. So it's her. Granger, Peacock, they're all going to be in Mr. Rumbold's office. He looks like a young Nosferatu with no earlobes. <laughs> <laughs> he does. He is a, a, a very British looking Strange man. looking man, yeah. He also has the lightest um, sideburns. Yeah. Yeah. But again, that could be maybe an issue of the colorization. But in the colorized version of this, his sideburns are very weird looking. But Jay, you were right. He is very Nosferatu. The no earlobes thing got me. I'm like, what is it about him? He tells him that Mr. Granger's been running the, st- he tells them all rather that Mr. Granger has been running the store and that display for about 25 years. He should continue to do so, but it's important that they all pull together to make this machine work smoothly. Rumbold is then compared to Solomon, but um, he doesn't really get the reference and they're trying to explain it to him, but it's not really going anywhere. And, Plus, the cutting the baby in half comparison didn't really work in this situation. They really harp on the Solomon thing a little too long, I think. It was weird. It just didn't fit. It wasn't a good comparison, so it was, like, even weirder when they were trying to further explain it. And it leads to, like, a weird thing about her being, like, I don't have a baby, and then that goes on a tangent. We were like, uh, guys, I think we're losing the plot a bit in this. Yeah, because then she's, she's like, and if I did, it would have nothing to do with where I hung my underwear up. And then it gets mentioned that she's not married, and I'm like, I was like, this conversation's off the rails. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, that's what I mean from earlier, that it just builds upon everything. It was like they wanted that scene to be a certain length, but instead of having it like they state their cases and then he decides on something, he made the decision as soon as they walked in, and now they're trying to fill space. <laughs> and like, So now they're just going everywhere with this conversation. But I think that's what they want you to see, that this is the way that the store is. This is the way that the store is going to be run. They're all idiots, essentially. In any event, the decision gets made and we see them all head out of the office and you can tell just by like Slocum and Granger's faces, you know what the decision was just by reading them. But Peacock calls the whole staff together to kind of make it like an official announcement. And once everyone finds out what, what we're going to be doing and just having the men's department still run it, Granger kind of offers as a sign of good faith to let them display one bra. And she agrees and says, I know just the one and pulls up that light up bra display from earlier. And uh, puts it like right on the top of the display, which uh, results in Granger immediately heading over to the phone and then tries to call call Rumble. I didn't know. I mean, I actually forgot. Joe, you mentioned it earlier, but like I forgot by the time this happened in the episode that that thing even existed. Yeah, so it was like a clever callback to really? use it. I knew the second she said he said one bra, that was what she was going to pull. I out. thought she was going to put like a bra on a male mannequin or something silly. Like I, I, I didn't know where they were going to go with it. I will say when this part happened, it made me think again, not until just now we were talking about it, but I, it came up in the episode that I feel like Drew Carey show definitely took a bit of a debt from this and I never put it together until now. Oh yeah. The whole department store thing, the department store thing and they're above it and they're always running off. It's like the woman who's kind of exaggerated. They're not so much on the sales floor though. Yeah. This is like the same sort of premise of the Drew Carey show, but from the Executive. administrative yeah, uh, yeah. Point of view, and like always running to the boss to go complain. Well, there was an American version that got made. And they made a pilot, but it never, it never made it to air. Were you able to see who was in the pilot? Was there anybody notable? Not that I remember. Uh, I wish I could. If I found it, I can try to look back at it. But I was looking at it this like earlier today, and now I don't have it pulled up. It was like 
Boston was in the name. I don't know if it was supposed to take place in Boston. Though. I mean, it would make sense because Boston is, you know, the first place the English started coming to from. It was called Beans of Boston. That was the, and Beans, I'm guessing, was the name of the department store. Yeah, B-E-A-N, B-E-A-N-E. And yeah, it was like uh, Bean, <laughs> not Mr. Bean. Bean. Oh my God, I would watch that in a second if it was Mr. Bean. But it's funny, when you look at it, I'll send you guys a link at some point. If you guys ever look look it up, though, a lot of the people in it, supposed to come out in 79, and a lot of the characters had similar names. Like, there was a John Peacock, May Slocum, George Humphreys, but then there's, like, Franklin Bean, there's a Mr. Lucas, uh, there's a Brams. So they, they reuse a lot of the names. It was, like, very much an adaptation. Oh, there's a lot of interesting people in this cast, too, including wow. Charlotte Ray. Girls! 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 <laughs> I don't love how it's often Garrett. that gets to be used in our episodes. <laughs> okay, well, I think maybe we find... I don't know if it's even findable. I'm looking at the complete pilot broadcast, May 5th, 1979, on YouTube right now. Oh. Okay, that's a save for later. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's, um, I mean, we covered the whole episode and I don't have much else to say other than like kind of the fact that they did the American adaptation. The show lasted a while. The song, when they, they play it out, it has different lyrics at the end than at the beginning. That's not uncommon for some shows, especially of that era. When or for Mankind. Mankind had two different I didn't notice at the time until I was looking up the lyrics for this and then, but you already had them. What I thought was interesting is it took about, uh, more than 10 years for it to get played in America and it was through PBS. So like all of these shows like this, like this red dwarf keeping up appearances, Monty Python, like all this stuff that people hold so dear weirdly all because of public broadcasting, which is a really interesting thing. And it makes me kind of sad now because now I think it's Brit box or one of those channels has the rights to all of that stuff. It doesn't air on any of those channels anymore. It's like, you can't even watch it terrestrially anymore you have to either subscribe or buy these like full box sets that now some of them are out of print and super expensive yeah that's a shame that really is a shame or what maybe if you have bbc america no maybe it plays it on there yeah i mean bbc owns the rights to all of these and i'm sure they own brit box yeah but bbc's dying no the bbc will never die the bbc no huge. they lost the thing that um it was funded by taxpayers there and they lost that so now they have to figure out how to pay for it. It's been on, it's been on the news. I can see that being a profitable entity, though, if you want to own it outright. Like, I'm sure there's plenty of money in that. I don't know. Their ratings are really low right now, too. I think that's why people are upset. I love how Ferg has his finger on the pulse of the BBC for some yeah. reason. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that because of Doctor Who. I was say, he watches a lot of Doctor Who. I was say Doctor Who, yeah. But, I mean, BBC, I mean, so many great shows that come out of that. So many great musical recordings. I mean, all the, even... Even if you don't like the radio session stuff or whatever, I mean, those Beatles at the Beeb compilations where they do all those radio sessions there are like such interesting takes on those songs. BBC is kind of an amazing thing that existed to be publicly uh, funded for so long. Yeah, it's what PBS should be. It really is. It's yeah. like what, what PBS should be here. I mean, I still think PBS plays some really interesting stuff. Like, I love. Oh, I love Nova. Like, Nova is one of those things that, like. I mean, I, I will say, though, I've never watched a full episode of Nova because you put Nova on in bed and you're like, this is so weirdly dry and interesting, but you will be asleep in like 20 minutes. So I'm always like, "Ooh, I wonder what they're going to find in that submarine. You never know. There's no nope. getting to the nope. end of an episode. Got a lot of these nerds over here, huh? <laughs> what was that, Mr. Doctor Who? Who are you calling a nerd <laughs> right now? Berg, you should see my adaptation. I call it Doctor Pooh. Well, on that note. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, uh, that being said, I guess it's time to move along to the Green Lantern cancel. <laughs> Gordo, is that just the time that you shit in a telephone booth? <laughs> is that what you're calling it with a scarf on? <laughs> no, but it's also the time that I call myself Dr. Pooh Medicine Woman. <laughs> but that doesn't rhyme. <laughs> Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. Yeah, if you can find a poo word that rhymes with Quinn, I will give you the joke. Dr. Squints Medicine Woman. <laughs> Does not rhyme also. <laughs> Quinn and squints? What are you doing right now? I don't know. I'm sleepy. I need a nap. You flew too sub. close to the sun after Dr. Pooh. <laughs> yeah, Dickerous. You should have quit while you're Dickerous. <laughs> Come <in> Dickerous. <laughs> well, I think before this flies too Wrap often. It up, Jay. <laughs> yeah, it's time to get into the Green Liner cancel. Dickerous. Um... 
Gordo, since this is an unofficial Gordo pick, uh, I'm going to start with you. Why are you going to make me go first? This is a 100% green light from Gordo. This is just funny, top to bottom. The jokes all work. It's a good mix of people. The show makes me want to see a second episode and to see what kind of shenanigans that the store gets into. Love me some good British comedy. It's a uh, green light from Gordo. Nick. Yeah, this is one of those shows discussing it with you guys gave me a, a brighter light on it. I really wasn't a fan of it watching it. I was just, I just think this is one of those. It's lost in time to me. Had I been of age at the time that this came out, I think I would have really enjoyed it. But it's just something indescribable about it that I really don't enjoy for some reason. The characters were well done. They all acted well. You know, the writing was okay. I just, you know, visually and and everything, I just wasn't engaged in it at all. And I don't, and like I said, I think it's a product of the time. Maybe a reimagining of this today on anything but Netflix <laughs> might work. But yeah, no, I just, I just really wasn't feeling it. I didn't care to watch another episode. I was okay with just watching this one. So it's a cancel for me. Joe. Earlier, I said that I liked the show. It was just going to be hard for us to do. And I honestly think we did a better job than I thought we were going to of getting through it. But it's a it's a workplace comedy, but it's almost all dialogue. So it's hard to review something like that, right? Because it, it eventually just turns into like, and then he said this and that was funny, right? But when you watch it, it is funny and you're laughing at it the whole time. So it's a green light for me. I think it's a really enjoyable show. I would love to watch this. I looked up how much it costs to get that BritBox channel because it's like there's so much stuff on there now I'd love to get it and if I do I'm gonna for sure watch all of this I haven't seen it since I was a kid and it definitely is like a weird warm place right thinking about being a kid and watching this at night so it's a green light for me also Gordo the kinky Blazing Saddles you're thinking of yes kinky kinky Blazing Saddles which is I think the same year as this probably Makes sense. It's one of two movies he's he's seen. I was going to say, Gordo yeah. couldn't remember an episode of a TV show because he doesn't watch TV, but he watches Blazing Saddles like fortnightly for some reason. It's a great movie. Ferg, you're right. Oh, it's a great movie. I'm actually surprised at the green light for me, and I thought I was going to be the only person to green light it, but apparently I'm the person that uh, puts it over. Listen, it, some of the dialogue when it starts, you're like, oh no, what did we get into? And then it's joke after joke. And I just found myself laughing throughout the entire thing as like weird as it was. I have these terrible memories of being forced to watch this show when I was younger. And it's just completely different now. I think all the casts are good. They're memorable. That was a lot. Like as Joe brought up, that was a lot of cast to get to know in 28 minutes. Other than like the big boss and the secretary. But, you know, they were there for a second. You really did get a sense for every single character like who they are and they did a very good job with that in a short time so green light well at this point my vote doesn't matter uh on a technical standpoint it's a it's a cancel for me i think a lot of jokes when i read it through and i'm doing notes and i'm like going through the transcript it's very clever and there's a lot of really good writing in here but it just a lot of the jokes didn't land with me in real time and I was really struggling to get through it. I was just getting a little bored watching it. No, listen, I, mean, I, I, gave it, I gave it my best. Like I said, I think it was written really well. But just like the deliveries don't quite land with me. So in real time watching, I just wasn't laughing. One thing I did want to note about the show that we didn't get into earlier is this is the episode's about 20 minutes, 28 minutes long. And it exists in about 28 minutes worth of time. Everything that's happening in this is kind of linear. Like this could operate as a play and work the same exact way because all the time is true true to form the whole way across it's one scene basically and until the very end when we go get in a uh rumble's office we never leave that one area the entire time that's super interesting you're right it, it could play as a play very well that's a pretty interesting yeah takeaway from that oh by the way the thing i said about bbc that's not until 2027 okay so they've got some years to pull they together some time yeah but uh, yeah, I mean, just to, to wrap it up, I, again, I, I don't want to say I hated it because I think there was a lot of cleverness behind it, but I just, I wasn't entertained in a way that I'd be interested in watching more based on this episode. Now I'll say like, even I think when you go on IMDb that it has like a little kind of commercial that shows you like future episodes and like little clips, I'm, with time and as the years progress, 
Uh, it looks like it gets a little more silly, and there's probably some stuff that I'd like in there. But this episode itself, you could wrap it up in a moment, right? The the whole episode is the women's department's moving into the men's department, and they're fighting over a center display. That's the episode. And I, I don't know, it just wasn't enough for me. Yeah. But in any event, yeah, it's um three out of five. So congratulations to Are You Being Served? You're still getting the green light from us. Not for me specific, but. I didn't think this was going to get higher than 40%. 60 surprised me. I thought I was going to be the only one to green light it. I, was- I didn't. I honestly thought, I mean, I mean, as we were talking beforehand, before we actually started recording and meeting and doing this just via chat, I really, I thought it was uh, for sure canceled. Yeah, the way you guys were talking, I thought it was a cancel. Ferg likes to mislead us even off air for some reason. He's done this before. He'll act like he likes or doesn't like something and then goes the other way when we get the, uh, get to the green light. You're welcome. I'm an entertainer. <laughs> <laughs> In any event, guys, congratulations. Are you being served? You do move on to episode two. And that's it. That's all the time we have this week, guys. Go to s1e1pod.com. That's where you can find all the links everywhere where you can listen to us, subscribe to us on our socials, hit us up, shoot us messages. We like taking suggestions. Like we said, this one is a hybrid suggestion versus Gordo pick that we vetoed. But um, it, it's been really great talking to all you guys. It was because of our fans that we did this. It is, because we we were going to just veto it forever. You know, keep sending in suggestions. And we got a couple coming up that were suggested to us on the lead up. And we have episode 100 right around the corner. Keep interacting with us, guys. We really appreciate it. But again, that's all the time we have for this week. Catch you next week. Thank you. Goodbye. I think we got the best Captain John Smith Peacock. (laughs) Kinky.